Thank you, guys. Well, it's great to see all of you, whether you're here, you're watching online, or watching on Facebook, or watching later. We are so thankful you've joined us. Amish, thank you for your service in Next Gen Ministry. Also, thank you for tutoring my son in Algebra 2. I appreciate that as well. <laughs> He's a great tutor and a great guy, so we're thankful for him in our church. Well, if you'll open up to 2 Samuel 22 or click your Bible app and go to 2 Samuel 22. Pastor, there's a lot of people in here. This is, uh, we're starting to get it back a little bit. That's fantastic. It's awesome. So 2 Samuel 22. I love music. And I don't know if you realize this, but like God created music. It wasn't a man-made thing. God created music. And I, I grew up in Texas, so I love country music, you know, just like Garth Brooks. I mean, just can't, can't beat that. And I love pop music. I love a few rap songs and just one or two heavy metal songs, but I love music. I think the best decade without question is 80s music. If you disagree, you're just wrong and that's okay, but 80s is the best decade. But today we're going to look at David's last song. Like this is probably the last song that King David actually sang. Before David was a king, he was a singer, songwriter. It's hard to picture him like this. I kind of picture like this ultimate warrior, but this man could be one of the most talented and versatile men in all in the entire Bible. At least 73 Psalms are assigned to David. And after studying this passage, I'm pretty certain that this is the last song that he actually sang. It's the longest stretch of text attributed to David within the two books of 1 and 2 Samuel. Psalm 18 is David's longest psalm, and it's almost identical to 2 Samuel 22. The song celebrates the providence of God in delivering David from all his enemies. Let's just look briefly at verse 4. It says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Now, if you grew up in church, you probably recognize that verse as a, as a song we used to sing back in the day. You see, five of the descriptions in verses two and three emphasize God as protector and defender, a function that David was very much appreciative of during his military encounters. Aren't you thankful for the names of God? If you've never done a study on the names of God, I would encourage you to do so because you will come out feeling so much compassion and love for God and all the names that are portrayed in who he is. But as we look at this study of God, we, we have to be thankful for these names. And no matter what we're going through, there is a name that will bring you comfort when we look at the names of God. Just listen to these words. Rock, fortress, deliverer, shield, horn of my salvation, stronghold, refuge, savior, these images came out of David's years in the wilderness when he was hiding with his men in, in natural fortress and caves. That's when some of these words came out. The song has a very personal tone. I'm sure he felt exhaustion. He was only human. He was so weary David, think about this, lifted his hands and writes these incredible words that we're going to look at. But listen to the tone. It's not what you would expect, after all, that he has been through. Let's look at verses 1 through 4, and let's read these together. And David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies. And from the hand of Saul, he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Just in these first verses, there are 11 first-person pronouns. Now, just a few of the first-person pronouns are I, my, we, and us. And we see 11 right here in these first few verses that are discussed with us. Three metaphors portray God's intervention in an active way. The Lord is deliverer, the horn of my salvation. The horn represents strength. 
like the horn of a ram or like the horn of a bull. And of course, the word Savior is mentioned here. As we look at verses 5 through 7, let's take a look at this. It says, For the ways of death encompass me, and the torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I called. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. Why, Why did God do this? Why did this happen? Simple. David called on the Lord. You see, nothing has changed. David called on the Lord, and we can still call on the Lord for help. You say, well, what's this distress? You know, let me explain. You don't have to wait till distress to pray, but you can pray in distress. And David was praying here in distress. What are some of the things he was distressed about? He's lost his son. He's lost his nation. He's losing it. Also, his people were in disarray. He was also about to enter another war with the Philistines, his enemies. And yet, verse 7 says here, David called and God heard. And by the way, in case you're wondering, God still hears. Isn't that refreshing to know that God still hears? Because of God's consistent help, David had confidence to call on the Lord, who is worthy of praise. So the first promise we're going to see this morning in this study is that when times are tough, God is our only security. He is our only security. This is not a distant deity that David is crying out to that's preoccupied with other galaxies. His God heard his voice. He finds delight in us. He cares. He feels our aches. God sees and cares about what is happening in your life, no matter how big or no matter how small you may think that it is. Verse 8, David shows the reader that it is the Lord who controls the earth. He shook the entire cosmos as an expression of his concern for David. Look at this verse in verse 8. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. What a thought that is, that that's the power of God that we see. No wonder the enemies of David fled in terror. David didn't see himself as a great commander who led a victorious army, but as God's servant who trusted Jehovah to win the battle. Not only does verse 10 tell us that God came down, but also we see in verses 17 and 18 the rescue operation. He reached down and drew him out and delivered him from the strong enemy. Now, verses 8 through 16 are metaphorical in nature, but they express the truth that God responds in a powerful way in our time of need. Look at the verbs used to describe God's deliverance in verse 17. He reached down, he took hold, he drew out, and he rescued. He rescued David. Now, the sea in this time period was considered very mysterious and often a terrifying place. David is suggesting that his experiences and circumstances had been life-threatening as the waters in the stormy sea. Without question, David is experiencing near death. He is facing certain death in this particular passage of scripture. Make no mistake that in the school of life, God promotes those who in times of difficulty learn the lessons of patience and faith. Verses 22 through 25, let's look at those Let's read these together. For I've kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me and from his statutes, I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him and I kept myself from guilt and the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness 
in his sight. Now, you may be saying, wait, is this the same King David that had some issues with some people in the past? Yes, it's the same King David. The secret to David's success was that he took responsibility for his sin, and he got back up. I love the book of Proverbs that tells us, though the righteous man falls, he gets back up. And that's exactly what David did. David absolutely committed sin, but his overall life was characterized by faithfulness to God's direction. Let me just say this. You are not your past. And you're not just what you've done in your past. You know, we think about that and we say, well, you know what, Jody, but you don't know what I've done. You're right. I don't know what you've done, but I know what David did. And I know God's response to David was forgiveness and mercy and restoration. And he will do the same for you if you will simply reach out to him and ask him. God is a God of mercy. Verse 26 and 28 shows us this as well. Let's look at these verses. It says, with the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you deal purely. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. You save a humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. The Lord never violates his own attributes. God deals with people according to their attitudes and their actions. David was merciful to Saul on two different occasions. Remember that? We talked about that. I truly believe God was merciful to David because David was merciful to others. So God was merciful to him. Matthew 5, 7, we see this also in the Sermon on the Mount when we hear, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Let's look at verse 29. It says, for you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God lightens my darkness. This leads us to our second promise, that when days are dark, the Lord is our only light. He will give you just enough inches for you to see the next step. Don't expect to see everything that God has for you. If you saw everything that God has for you, your mind would be absolutely blown. Like, have you ever known someone, that person that buys a book, and they take the book, and they read the last chapter of the book just to see what happens before they start in the first chapter because they're afraid they may not make it to the end? Or have you ever known someone that starts a Netflix series and they go to the last episode and they watch it just in case they don't make it throughout all of the episodes? Like that's not normal human behavior to do those things. That's not normal. The Lord tells us in Psalm 27.1, which is another Psalm of David, he says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? He's asking the question, why would I be afraid when the Lord is my light? What an awesome promise that is. He will shield you from the fears you may be facing right now. Maybe you're facing financial fears. That's legitimate. Maybe you're facing the fear of just the unknown. Or maybe you're facing the fear that 2020 will never come to an end. Or maybe you're facing the fear of illness or getting sick. Those are real fears, but the Lord has proven to be true in his word. Let's look at verse 31. This God, his way is perfect. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. Who are you taking refuge in today? Is it in God who will shield you or is it something else? Verse 32, we see David use two names of God. We see the name Elohim and Yahweh. It says, for who is God but the Lord and who is a rock except our God? So Yahweh is the covenant name of the Lord. 
To know Yahweh is to know the covenant Lord of the Israelites, the covenant name of the patriarchs of Israel. Elohim is used in the context when creation is mentioned. So he combines both of these here, and he basically says this, he is the God of creation and the Lord of the covenant. We also see this word rock. Who is a rock except our God? You can do a little bit more study. We don't have time to get into it this morning. You can read Deuteronomy 32.4 or Psalm 18.31 and find out a little bit more about the rock. But this rock is massive. It's an unshakable foundation and a source of protection. It stresses the unchanging nature of God in contrast with the fickle nature of people. Man, people change, don't they? People let us down, don't they? But God is the rock. He never lets us down. This word rock reminds us of strength and stability, dependable and unchanging. That's the God that we serve. Verse 34 tells us that we are, su- we are protected and supported by the strength and the power of God. He gives us the ability to do what he is called us to do. Can I, can I say that again? He gives you the ability to do what he has called you to do. Look at verse 34. He made my feet like the feet of a deer. I guess he's just saying, I got really fast and set me secure on the heights. You see, God will give you those abilities if you do what he has called you to do. He is the one who protects you from external threat. He is the rock and fortress. He's the one who protects you from enemy arrows. He is your shield. He is the one who hides David from harm. He is a refuge. He is the one who anoints David for purpose. He is the horn of salvation. We can say without question, David was facing a high level of stress. When we feel overwhelmed, it is a reminder to us that we are living out of the limits of our own boundaries that God has created for us. Maybe you need to reevaluate. Maybe you need to cut back. Maybe you need to slow down. You don't have to experience those things. But let's look here also at verse 47. Let's look at this celebration moment. The Lord lives. Now, capital L-O-R-D, that's Yahweh. Yahweh lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. Yes, there is a God. He is not just a force or a power, but a living being. He has a name, and it's personal. And because it's personal, you can approach him in the context of a personal relationship. What an amazing thing that we get to have a relationship with Yahweh Elohim. We get to go to him. We get to boldly approach him. We get to talk to him. Why? Because Jesus, the sweetest name that we know, has reconciled us back to God when he died on the cross and took our sin and became sin for us. And he arose on the third day. God raised him from the dead. And because of that... We can go to God and we can talk to him and we can share our burdens and our sorrows. You see, you are in the hands of Jesus. You're protected by the rock. No power on earth can get you out of God's mighty hands. And listen to this. It says this in scripture. I'm not just making this stuff up. Nothing I said except that 80s is the best decade of music was my opinion. This is God's word. And listen to what it says in John 10, 28 through 29. I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one can snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. 
So if you've ever wondered about eternal security, let me just sum it up for you. Ephesians 4.30 tells us that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption. This passage tells us that Jesus has us in one hand, and God the Father has us in one hand, and we are sealed by the triune God. The Trinity has our back. If you've been saved and you know you're saved, you don't ever have to worry about that ever, ever again. That's what God's Word tells us. You can rejoice in that. But verses five through seven here that we read, we ask ourselves, why did God wait all those years before delivering David and putting him on the throne? The Lord was building himself a leader. Oftentimes that takes trials. That takes suffering. That takes some battles. Verse 50 and 51, David closes his psalm probably his last literary work with praise. Let's see what it says here. Verse 50. For this, I will praise you, O Lord, among the nation and sing praises to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. Let me just say this. At your core, at your core, before you're a son or daughter, before you're a brother or sister, before you are a husband or wife, before you're a father or mother, at the very core of you, at the very essence of your soul, the inmost part of you, be a worshiper of Jesus first. Make sure you can be defined as a worshiper of Jesus. That's what David was. This last statement in verse 51 of this chapter once again confirms the Davidic covenant found in 2 Samuel 7 that we've talked about weeks prior to. We know it's pretty amazing to think this. We know this. That in this book filled with burdens and bloodshed, it is bracketed with praise. It starts with Hannah and it ends with David. And all throughout, there's, it's just a mess. But there's praise all throughout this amazing book that we've been studying. In all that David did, he sought to please the Lord, obey the law, and honor his promises and trust those promises. 2 Samuel 23, 5. David recognized that his family was not where it needed to be. And if you've been here or watched online, you know his family was a mess because there's consequences for sin. God forgives us, but friends, make no mistake, those consequences remain, but his family was a mess. But the everlasting covenant still remains found in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 14. From the beginning of God's plan was that the nation of Israel would be the vehicle that would bring salvation to a lost world. That was the plan. That's why the Jewish people are so special, because they brought us Jesus through the line of David. What an awesome thing that that is. Salvation is of the Jews. You can also see that in John 4, when Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman. And he says, salvation is of the Jews. So our third promise is that when our walk is weak, the Lord is our strength. We see this in verses 32 through 33. We can face whatever life throws at us when our strength is in him. Verse 37 lets us know that my feet did not slip. Sounds a little bit like 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. When Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, God's great power is perfected in our weakness. So, are you weak this morning? Fantastic. Because God is strong in you. At the moment you feel the weakest, that is when God is the strongest. What a blessing that is to know that promise. Your hope, security, and your faith, and your strength are found in Christ alone. He is your hope in uncertain times. And friends, we are in uncertain times. He sheds light in your darkness. He lifts you out of the pit 
and places you on the rock, and he is the rock. As we've studied this book for almost six months now, what a joy it's been. But make no mistake who the hero is of First and Second Samuel. It's not Hannah. It's not Samuel. And it's not King David, believe it or not. It's definitely not Saul. The hero of the book of Samuel is Yahweh. He is the deliverer. He's the one that's making all these things happen. And he's the one that will do the same for you. You see, we Gentiles, we owe a great debt to the Jews. It was through David's descendants that God brought the Messiah into the world. From an ordinary Jewish family, David, the eighth son of Jesse, just a shepherd boy tending to his flock, God selected him and he became Israel's greatest king. God used him in amazing ways, but David didn't promote himself. God promoted him. God trained him in the sheep, with the sheep in the pasture. And he trained him also with Saul in the army camp through all those trials that he went to. And he trained him also with his own fighting men in the Judean wilderness. God was training and molding this king who would lead the nation of Israel to greatness. You see, great leaders are trained in private before they ever go to work in public. And David was trained in private with those sheep. He was becoming this amazing man. So whatever God is doing in your life right now, understand that God is putting you through that so that you will be what God wants you to be inch by inch, minute by minute, day by day as we go along. Now, there is no guarantee that righteous living equals visible blessings. We don't believe in the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel is this, that a belief that God's aim is to make believers healthy and wealthy as we seek to follow him. That's the prosperity gospel, that you become healthy and wealthy. Now, if you do, fantastic, but that's not God's aim. Let's make it clear. God's aim is for you to glorify him and for you to become like Jesus. That is God's aim. And he will do whatever it takes for you to, be, to do that. That's the aim of God. And this way of living, it never leads to enjoying God or becoming like him. It's more like using God but not really knowing him. All through the New Testament, specifically Paul, talks about suffering. He talks about what we face as the people of God. And one particular passage is Philippians 3.10 when he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. There's going to be some times as you walk with Jesus that you're gonna suffer you're going to lose somebody. You're going to hurt. You're going to struggle. You're going to have trials. You're going to have battles. That's part of being human, and it's part of becoming more and more like Jesus is understanding the sufferings that he faced. But in those sufferings, God is with you. When you are the weakest, God is the strongest in your life. You see, as we encounter God and experience community, as Amish was talking about just a little bit ago, and become like Christ, God's presence is felt and is active within us. We experience joy as we love God and we love others. This way leads to intimacy with God. If you want to live in the way of the Spirit, I want to just give you four quick steps as we close that you need to continually practice. If you have a phone, I want to write these down or paper. It's something we used to use, paper. You want to use that? That's fine, but I want these four steps. I want you to take these with you as we close. The first step to have true intimacy with God as David did. Number one is reflect on where you are. Paul said it like this, examine yourself to see whether or not you're in the faith. David said it like this, search me, O God, in all my ways. Try me in all my anxious thoughts and see if there's any wicked, offensive way in me. So you can examine and you can search. I mean, when you come to God's house, 
when you gather together with God's people, always reflect on where you are. If you're not trying to get better with Jesus and get closer to Jesus, you're just taking a spot. Man, our goal is to get closer and closer and more intimate with God. That is his desire. So reflect on where you are and what is happening in the world around you. How are you doing spiritually? And be honest with God. You might as well because he already knows where you are. Don't put on a, a facade when you come in this building. Don't put on a fake nature when you're in your group. Be who you really are so you can draw closer to God and you can become more and more intimate with him. So reflect on where you are. Second, recognize the fork in the road that is always before you. Recognize the fork in the road that is always before you. Listen, there's always a choice. There's always a decision. There's always a path. There's always a road. One road leads to destruction, and one road leads to everlasting life. I mean, you can choose to do the wrong thing, and you're just going to have to deal with it. When you walk away from God, you're alone. But when you walk with God, and you choose the way that leads to everlasting life, that narrow road, which let me assure you, few are pursuing the narrow road these days. It's becoming more and more and more rare, but you have a choice. You have a decision to make. You have that choice this morning. What road am I gonna take? Am I gonna go my own way? Am I gonna do my own thing? Or am I gonna follow God? Am I gonna choose his way? That's what God wants. Choose the way of the Lord. Choose to draw near to God. James 4, 7, and 8 says it like this. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. What a peace to know that the presence of God is with us on the right path. But make sure that you are staying on the right path. And that is little choices and little decisions that you make every single moment of every single day for the rest of your life. And just like David, when you fall, he fell hard. But when you fall, you get back up and you press on and you never look back, ever. Third, refocus your goals. Remind yourselves that our hearts are made and are made for God. And we find no rest until we find rest in God. Yeah, you can get sleep. You sleep well. But rest comes when we truly walk with God. What Jesus say? He said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. He was not talking about sleep. He was talking about rest in your soul, and you only find it in Christ. And the last, rest in God's grace. Humble yourself. Scripture tells us that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself to receive grace. It requires death of pride. The first sin that God hates more than any other sin is pride. And it also requires death of self-sufficiency. And it's not about what you think you can do. It's about what God can do through you. That's what it's about. And God wants you to just let go of those sayings and trust in him and rest in his grace. Well, let me just say this as I close. Everything that we just talked about, what God has done for you, he's forgiven you. He's shown you mercy. He's given you grace. The way of the Christian is that we take what God has given us and we give it to other people. And in our world right now, we need grace for each other. We need forgiveness for each other. We need restoration for each other. So everything that God has done for you, now take it and give it to other people people. That's what God wants for us. Let's pray together. Lord, 
as we approach you with abandonment and confidence, we are dedicated to knowing you on a deeper level. God, we want to enjoy you. We want to experience you. But God, we know there are some steps that we have to take to do that. And God, there may be someone in this room right now who has never said yes to Jesus. They've never asked Jesus Christ to be their Lord of their life. And right now, the Holy Spirit is knocking on the door of their life and Jesus is right there and he's saying, let me in. But God, we gotta open the door. And I pray there's someone in this room right now or watching online who would say, Jody, if I'm honest with you, I've never taken the time to receive Jesus Christ as my personal savior, but I want to. I pray that you just make yourself so real to them. Help them to reach out to us as we can guide them through what it means to become a Christian. But if you're in this room right now, let me talk to just you for a second with your heads bowed and eyes closed. If you'd be honest and say, Jody, I'm trying to live with my own strength. I am doing my own thing. I'm just trying to make it happen on my own and I can't do it anymore. Man, Jody, I, I just need Jesus. I need Jesus to come in. I need him to take over. I need the Holy Spirit of God to live inside of me. That's what I need. If that's you this morning, if you just be honest, say, I know that I'm a sinner. The Bible is so clear that all of us have sinned. All of us fall short of the glory of God. But I believe this. What you're describing, I believe that Jesus died and I believe that he arose again on the third day. And now I wanna make my profession of faith. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, no one's looking around but me. If you'd be honest with me this morning, I'm the only person that can see, and of course God sees. You say, Jody, I don't have Jesus in my life. I've never invited the Lord Jesus Christ to be my personal savior. He is personal. He requires you to ask him to come in. If you've never done that, would you just real quick, just raise your hand so I could pray for you? Anybody like that in the room? Just say, Jody, I don't have a personal relationship with the Father through Jesus. Anybody like that? Okay. Amen. Well, the rest of us, let's make sure that we are giving these same things to other people just as God has given them to us. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this church. Thank you that so many people are here today. What a blessing that is to us to see their faces. Thank you for the people watching online with us, watching on Facebook, watching later. Thank you for that. God bless our church. May we be a church that always shows and displays the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness that you gave us. May we also give it back to others. We pray this in Jesus' name.